Five Little Pigs by Agatha Christie Read by Hugh Fraser Carla Le Marchant Hercule Poirot looked with interest and appreciation at the young woman who was being ushered into the room. There had been nothing distinctive in the letter she had written. It had been a mere request for an appointment, with no hint of what lay behind that request. It had been brief and businesslike. Only the firmness of the handwriting had indicated that Carla Le Marchant was a young woman. And now here she was in the flesh. A tall, slender young woman in the early twenties, the kind of young woman that one definitely looked at twice. Her clothes were good, an expensive well-cut coat and skirt and luxurious furs. Her head was well poised on her shoulders. She had a square brow, a sensitively cut nose, and a determined chin. She looked very much alive. It was her aliveness more than her beauty which struck the predominant note. Before her entrance, Hercule Poirot had been feeling old. Now he felt rejuvenated, alive, keen. As he came forward to greet her, he was aware of her dark grey eyes studying him attentively. She was very earnest in that scrutiny. She sat down and accepted the cigarette that he offered her. After it was lit, she sat for a minute or two smoking, still looking at him with that earnest, thoughtful gaze. Poirot said gently, Yes, it has to be decided, does it not? She started. I beg your pardon? Her voice was attractive, with a faint, agreeable huskiness in it. You are making up your mind, are you not, whether I am a mere mountebank or the man you need? She smiled. She said, Well, yes, something of that kind. You see, Monsieur Poirot, you, you don't look exactly the way I pictured you. I am old, am I not? Older than you imagined. Yes, that too. She hesitated. I'm being frank. You see, I want... I've got to have the best. Rest assured, said Hercule Poirot, I am the best. Carla said, You're not modest. All the same, I'm inclined to take you at your word. Poirot said placidly, One does not, you know, employ merely the muscles. I do not need to bend and measure the footprints and pick up the cigarette ends and examine the bent blades of grass. It is enough for me to sit back in my chair and think. It is this, he tapped his egg-shaped head, this that functions. I know, said Carlo the Marchant. That's why I've come to you. I want you, you see, to do something fantastic. That, said Hercule Poirot, promises well. He looked at her in encouragement. Carla Le Marchant drew a deep breath. My name, she said, isn't Carla, it's Caroline, the same as my mother's. I was called after her. She paused. And though I've always gone by the name of Le Marchant, my real name is Crail. Hercule Poirot's forehead creased a moment perplexedly. He murmured, Crail. I seem to remember, she said, my father was a painter, rather a well-known painter. Some people say he was a great painter. I think he was. Hercule Poirot said, Amaius Crail? Yes. She paused. Then she went on, and my mother, Caroline Crail, was tried for murdering him. Aha, said Hercule Poirot, I remember now, but uh, only vaguely. I was abroad at the time. It was a long time ago. Sixteen years, said the girl. Her face was very white now, and her eyes two burning lights. She said, Do you understand? She was tried and convicted. She wasn't hanged because they felt that there were extenuating circumstances, so the sentence was commuted to penal servitude for life, but she died only a year after the trial. You see, it's all over. Done. Finished with. Poirot said quietly, And so? The girl called Carla de Marchant pressed her hands together. She spoke slowly and haltingly, but with an odd pointed emphasis. She said, You've got to understand exactly where I come in. 
I was five years old at the time. It happened. Too young to know anything about it. I remember my mother and my father, of course, and I remember leaving home suddenly, being taken to the country. I remember the pigs and a nice, fat farmer's wife and everybody being very kind, and I remember quite clearly the funny way they used to look at me. Everybody. A sort of furtive look. I knew, of course, children do, that there was something wrong, but I didn't know what. And then I went on a ship. It was exciting. It went on for days. And then I was in Canada, and Uncle Simon met me, and I lived in Montreal with him and Aunt Louise. And when I asked about Mummy and Daddy, they said they'd be coming soon, and then... And then I think I forgot. Only I sort of knew that they were dead, without remembering anyone actually telling me so, because by that time, you see, I didn't think about them any more. I was very happy, you know. Uncle Simon and Aunt Louise were sweet to me, and I went to school and had a lot of friends, and I'd quite forgotten that I'd ever had another name, not Lamarchant. Aunt Louise, you see, told me that was my name in Canada, and it seemed quite sensible to me at the time. It was just my Canadian name. But as I say, I forgot in the end that I'd ever had any other. She flung up her defiant chin. She said, Look at me. You'd say, wouldn't you, if you met me, there goes a girl who's got nothing to worry about. I'm well off, I've got splendid health, I'm sufficiently good to look at, I can enjoy life. At twenty there wasn't a girl anywhere I'd have changed places with. But already, you know, I'd begun to ask questions. About my own mother and father, who they were and what they did. I'd have been bound to find out in the end. As it was, they told me the truth. When I was twenty-one, they had to then, because for one thing I came into my own money— and then, you see, there was the letter, the letter my mother left for me when she died. Her expression changed, dimmed. Her eyes were no longer two burning points. They were dark, dim pools. She said, That's when I learnt the truth, that my mother had been convicted of murder. It was rather horrible. She paused. There's something else I must tell you. I was engaged to be married. They said we must wait, that we couldn't be married until I was twenty-one. When I knew, I understood why. Poirot stirred, and spoke for the first time. He said, And what was your fiancé's reaction? John? John didn't care. He said it made no difference, not to him. He and I were John and Carla, and the past didn't matter. She leaned forward. We're still engaged, but all the same, you know, it does matter. It matters to me, and it matters to John, too. It isn't the past that matters to us. It's the future. She clenched her hands. We want children, you see. We both want children. And we don't want to watch our children growing up and be afraid. Poirot said, Do you not realize that amongst everyone's ancestors there has been violence and evil? You don't understand. That's so, of course. But then one doesn't usually know about it. We do. It's very near to us. And sometimes I've seen John just look at me, such a quick glance, just a flash. Supposing we were married and we'd quarrelled, and I saw him look at me and... and wonder. Hercule Poirot said, How was your father killed? Carlo's voice became clear and firm. He was poisoned. Hercule Poirot said, I see. There was a silence. Then the girl said in a calm, matter-of-fact voice, Thank goodness you're sensible. You see that it does matter, and what it involves. You don't try to patch it up and trot out consoling phrases. I understand very well, said Poirot. What I do not understand is what you want of me. Carla Lamarchin said simply, I want to marry John. And I mean to marry John, and I want to have at least two girls and two boys, and you're going to make that possible. You mean you want me to talk to your fiancé? Uh, no, it is idiocy what I say there. It is something quite different that you are suggesting. Tell me what is in your mind. Listen, Monsieur Poirot. Get this, and get it clearly. I'm hiring you to investigate a case of murder. Do you mean? Yes, I do mean. A case of murder 
is a case of murder whether it happened yesterday or sixteen years ago. But, my dear young lady, wait, Monsieur Poirot. You haven't got it all yet. There's a very important point. Yes? My mother was innocent, said Carla Le Marchand. Hercule Poirot rubbed his nose. He murmured, Well, uh, naturally, I comprehend that it isn't sentiment. There's her letter. She left it for me before she died. It was to be given to me when I was twenty-one. She left it for that one reason, that I should be quite sure. That's all there was in it. That she hadn't done it. That she was innocent. That I could be sure of that always. Hercule Poirot looked thoughtfully at the young, vital face staring so earnestly at him. He said slowly, Tout de même, Carla smiled. No. Mother wasn't like that. You're thinking that it might be a lie, a sentimental lie. She leaned forward earnestly. Listen, Monsieur Poirot, there are some things that children know quite well. I can remember my mother. A patchy remembrance, of course, but I remember quite well the sort of person she was. She didn't tell lies, kind lies. If a thing was going to hurt, she always told you so. Dentists or thorns in your finger, all that sort of thing. Truth was a natural impulse to her. I wasn't, I don't think, especially fond of her, but I trusted her. I still trust her. If she says she didn't kill my father, then she didn't kill him. She wasn't the sort of person who would solemnly write down a lie when she knew she was dying. Slowly, almost reluctantly, Hercule Poirot bowed his head. Carla went on. That's why it's all right for me marrying John. I know it's all right, but he doesn't. He feels that naturally I would think my mother was innocent. It's got to be cleared up, Monsieur Poirot, and you're going to do it. Hercule Poirot said slowly, Granted that what you say is true, Monsieur. Sixteen years have gone by, Carlo Lamarchand said. Oh, of course, it's going to be difficult. Nobody but you could do it. Hercule Poirot's eyes twinkled slightly. He said, you give me the best butter, huh? Carla said, I've heard about you, the things you've done, the way you have done them. It's psychology that interests you, isn't it? Well, that doesn't change with time. The tangible things are gone, the cigarette end and the footprints and the bent blades of grass. You can't look for those any more, but you can go over all the facts of the case and perhaps talk to the people who were there at the time. They're all alive still. And then, and then, as you said just now, you can lie back in your chair and think, and you'll know what really happened. Hercule Poirot rose to his feet. One hand caressed his moustache. He said, Mademoiselle, I am honoured. I will justify your faith in me. I will investigate your case of murder. I will search back into the events of sixteen years ago, and I will find out the truth. Carla got up. Her eyes were shining, but she only said, Good. Hercule Poirot shook an eloquent forefinger. One little moment. I have said I will find out the truth. I do not, you understand, have the bias. I do not accept your assurance of your mother's innocence. If she was guilty, eh bien. What then? Carla's proud head went back. She said, I am her daughter. I want the truth, Hercule Poirot said. En avant, then. Though it is not that that I should say, on the contrary. En arrière. Book One Counsel for the Defence Do I remember the Crail case? asked Sir Montague de Pleach. Certainly I do. Remember it very well. Most attractive woman, but unbalanced, of course. No self-control. He glanced sideways at Poirot. What makes you ask me about it? I am interested. Not really tactful of you, my dear man, said de Pleach, showing his teeth in his sudden famous wolf's smile, which had been reputed to have such a terrifying effect upon witnesses. Not one of my successes, you know. I didn't get her off. I know that. Sir Montague shrugged his shoulders. He said— of course, I hadn't quite as much experience then as I have now. All the same, I think I did all that could humanly be done. One can't do much without cooperation. We did get it commuted to penal servitude. Provocation, you know. Lots of respectable wives and mothers got up a petition. There was a lot of sympathy for her. He leaned back, stretching out his long legs. 
His face took on a judicial, appraising look. If she'd shot him, you know, or even knifed him, I'd have gone all out for manslaughter, but poison? No. You can't play tricks with that. It's tricky, very tricky. What was the defence? asked Hercule Poirot. He knew, because he had already read the newspaper files, but he saw no harm in playing the complete ignorant to Sir Montague. Oh, uh, suicide. Only thing you could go for. But it didn't go down well. Crail simply wasn't that kind of man. You never met him, I suppose. No, well, he was a great blustering, vivid sort of chap, great womanizer, beer drinker, all the rest of it. Went in for the lusts of the flesh and enjoyed them. You can't persuade a jury that a man like that is going to sit down and quietly do away with himself. It just doesn't fit. No, I was afraid I was up against a losing proposition from the first. And she wouldn't play up. I knew we'd lost as soon as you went into the box. No fight in her at all. But there it is. If you don't put your client in the box, the jury draw their own conclusions. Poirot said, Is that what you meant when you said just now that one cannot do much without cooperation? Well, absolutely, my dear fellow. We're not magicians, you know. Half the battle is the impression the accused makes on the jury. I've known juries time and again bring in verdicts dead against the judges summing up. He did it all right. That's the point of view. Or, he never did such a thing like that. Don't tell me. Caroline Crail didn't even try to put up a fight. Why was that? Sir Montague shrugged his shoulders. Oh, don't ask me. Of course, she was fond of the fellow. Broke her all up when she came to and realized what she'd done. Don't believe she ever rallied from the shock. So, in your opinion, she was guilty? De Pleach looked rather startled. He said, Uh, well, I thought we were taking that for granted. Did she ever admit to you that she was guilty? De Pleach looked shocked. Well, of course not. Of course not. We have our code, you know. Innocence is always uh, assumed. If you're so interested, it's a pity you can't get hold of old Mayhew. Mayhew's were the solicitors who briefed me. Old Mayhew could have told you more than I can, but there he's joined the great majority. Uh, there's young George Mayhew, of course, but he was only a boy at the time. It's a long time ago, you know. Yes, I know. It is fortunate for me that you remember so much. You have a remarkable memory. De Pleach looked pleased. He murmured, Oh, well, uh, one remembers the main headings, you know, especially when it's a capital charge. And, of course, the Crail case got a lot of publicity from the press, lots of sex interest and all that. The girl in the case was pretty striking. Hard-boiled piece of goods, I thought. You will forgive me if I seem too insistent, said Poirot, but I repeat once more, you had no doubt of Caroline Crail's guilt. De Pleach shrugged his shoulders. He said, oh, frankly, as man to man, I don't think there's much doubt about it. Oh, yes, she did it all right. What was the evidence against her? Well, very damning indeed. First of all, there was motive. She and Crail had led a kind of cat-and-dog life for years. Interminable rows. He was always getting mixed up with some woman or other. Couldn't help it. He was that kind of man. She stood it pretty well on the whole, made allowances for him on the score of temperament, and the man really was a first-class painter, you know. His stuff's gone up enormously in price, enormously. Don't care for that style of painting myself. Ugly, forceful stuff, but it's good. No doubt of that. Well, as I say, there had been trouble about women from time to time. Mrs. Crail wasn't the meek kind who suffers in silence. They were rows all right. But he always came back to her in the end. These affairs of his blew over. But this final affair was rather different. It was a girl, you see. Quite a young girl. She was only twenty. Elsa Greer, that was her name. She was the only daughter of some Yorkshire manufacturer. She'd got money and determination, and she knew what she wanted. What she wanted was a Myas Crail. She got him to paint her. Uh, he, he didn't paint regular society portraits, Mrs. Blinkety Blank in satin and pearls, but he painted figures. I don't know that most women would have cared to be painted by him. He didn't spare them. But he painted the Greer girl, and he ended by falling for her good and proper. He was getting on for forty, you know and he'd been married a good many years. He was just right for making a fool of himself over some chit of a girl. Elsa Greer was the girl. He was crazy about her, and his idea was to get a divorce from his wife and marry Elsa. Caroline Crail wasn't standing for that. She threatened him. She was overheard by two people to say that if he didn't give the girl up, she'd kill him. And she meant it all right. The day before it happened, they'd been having tea with a neighbour. 
He was by way of dabbling in herbs and home-brewed medicines. Amongst his patent brews was one of Konaim, spotted hemlock. There was some talk about it and its deadly properties. The next day he noticed that half the contents of the bottle had gone, got the wind up about it. They found an almost empty bottle of it in Mrs. Crail's room, hidden away at the bottom of a drawer. Hercule Poirot moved uncomfortably. He said, "'Somebody else might have put it there.' "'Oh, she admitted to the police she'd taken it. Very unwise, of course. But she didn't have a solicitor to advise her at that stage. When they asked her about it, she admitted quite frankly that she'd taken it. For what reason? Well, she made out she'd taken it with the idea of doing herself in. She couldn't explain how the bottle came to be empty, nor how it was that there were only her fingerprints on it. That part of it was pretty damaging. She contended, you see, that Amias Crail had committed suicide. But if he'd taken the canine from the bottle she'd hidden in her room, his fingerprints would have been on the bottle as well as hers. It was given him in beer, was it not? Yes. She got out the bottle from the refrigerator and took it down herself to where he was painting in the garden. She poured it out and gave it to him and watched him drink it. Everyone went up to lunch and left him. He often didn't come in to meals. Afterwards she and the governess found him there dead. Her story was that the beer she gave him was all right. Our theory was that he suddenly felt so worried and remorseful that he slipped the poison in himself. Or poppycock. He wasn't that kind of man and the fingerprint evidence was the most damning of all. They found her fingerprints on the bottle? No, they didn't. They found only his, and they were phony ones. She was alone with the body, you see, while the governess went to call a doctor. And what she must have done was to wipe the bottle and glass, and then press his fingers on them. She wanted to pretend, you see, that she never even handled the stuff. No, well, that didn't work. Old Rudolph, who was prosecuting, had a lot of fun with that proved quite definitely by demonstrating in court that a man couldn't hold a bottle with his fingers in that position. Of course, we did our best to prove that he could, that his hands would take up a contorted attitude when he was dying, but frankly, our stuff wasn't very convincing. Hercule Poirot said, The cornine in the bottle must have been put there before she took it down to the garden. Well, there was no cornine in the bottle at all, only in the glass. He paused. His large, handsome face suddenly altered. He turned his head sharply. Hello, he said. Now then, Poirot, what are you driving at? Poirot said, If Caroline Crail was innocent, how did that conine get into the beer? The defense said at the time that Amias Crail himself had put it there. But you say to me that that was in the highest degree unlikely, and for my part, I agree with you. He was not that kind of man. Then, if Caroline Crail did not do it, someone else did. Dupleach said, with almost a splutter, oh, Damn it, old man! You can't flog a dead horse. It's all over and done with years ago. Of course she did it. You'd know that well enough if you'd seen her at the time. It was written all over her. I even fancied that the verdict was a relief to her. She wasn't frightened, no nerves at all, just wanted to get through the trial and have it over. Very brave woman, really. And yet— said Hercule Poirot, when she died she left a letter to be given to her daughter, in which she swore solemnly that she was innocent. Well, I dare say she did, said Sir Montague de Pleach. You or I would have done the same in her place. Her daughter says that she was not that kind of woman, the daughter says. <laughs> what does she know about it? My dear Poirot, the daughter was a mere infant at the time of the trial. What was she? Four? Five? They changed her name and sent her out of England somewhere to some relatives. What can she know or remember? Children know people very well sometimes. Or maybe they do. But that doesn't follow in this case. Naturally, the girl wants to believe her mother didn't do it. Let her believe it. It doesn't do any harm. But unfortunately, she demands proof. Proof that Caroline Crail didn't kill her husband? Yes. Well, said de Pleach, she won't get it. You think not? The famous K.C. looked thoughtfully at his companion. I've always thought you were an honest man, Poirot. What are you doing? Try to make money by playing on a girl's natural affections? You do not know the girl. She is an unusual girl, a girl of great force of character. Yes, I should imagine the daughter of Amias and Caroline Crail might be that. What does she want? She wants the truth. Hmm. I'm afraid she'll find the truth unpalatable. Honestly, Poirot, 
I don't think there's any doubt about it. She killed him. You will forgive me, my friend, but I must satisfy myself on that point. Well, I don't know what more you can do. You can read up the newspaper accounts of the trial. Humphrey Rudolph appeared for the Crown. He's dead. Let me see. Who was his junior? A young Fogg, I think. Yes, Fogg. You can have a chat with him. And then there are the people who were there at the time. I don't suppose they'll enjoy your butting in and raking the whole thing up, but I dare say you'll get what you want out of them. You're a plausible devil. Ah, yes, the people concerned. That is very important. You remember perhaps who they were? Depleach considered. Oh, let me see. It's a long time ago. There were only five people who were really in it, so to speak. I'm not counting the servants. A couple of faithful old things, scared-looking creatures. Uh, they didn't know anything about anything. No one could suspect them. There are five people, you say? Tell me about them. Well, there was uh, Philip Blake. He was Crail's greatest friend, had known him all his life. He was staying in the house at the time. He's alive. I see him now and again on the links. Lives at St. George's Hill, stockbroker. Plays the markets and gets away with it. Successful man. Running to fat a bit. Yes, and who next? Oh, then there was Blake's elder brother, country squire, stay-at-home sort of chap. A jingle ran through Poirot's head. He repressed it. He must not always be thinking of nursery rhymes. It seemed an obsession with him lately. And yet the jingle persisted. This little pig went to market. This little pig stayed at home. He murmured, He stayed at home. Yes? Uh, he's the fellow I was telling you about. Messed about with drugs and herbs. Bit of a chemist. His hobby. What was his name now? Literary sort of name. Oh, I've got it. Meredith. Meredith Blake. Don't know whether he's alive or not. And who next? Next? Well, there's the cause of all the trouble, the girl in the case. Elsa Greer. This little pig ate roast beef, murmured Poirot. Depleach stared at him. <laughs> They've fed her meat all right, he said. She's been a go-getter. She's had three husbands since then. In and out of the divorce court as easy as you please. And every time she makes a change, it's for the better. Lady Dittisham, that's who she is now. Open any tattler, and you're sure to find her. And the other two? Oh, there was the governess woman. Don't remember her name. Nice, capable woman. Thompson, Jones, something like that. And there was the child, Caroline Crail's half-sister. She must have been about fifteen. She's made rather a name for herself. Digs up things and goes trekking to the back of beyond. Uh, Warren, that's her name. Angela Warren. Rather an alarming young woman nowadays. I met her the other day. She is not then the little pig who cried, Wee, wee, wee. Sir Montague de Pleach looked at him rather oddly. He said dryly, oh, She's had something to cry wee, wee about in her life. She's disfigured, you know. Got a bad scar down one side of her face. She, uh, oh, well, uh, you'll hear all about it, I dare say. Poirot stood up. He said, I thank you. You have been very kind. If Mrs. Crail did not kill her husband, de Pleach interrupted him. But she did, old boy. She did. Take my word for it. Poirot continued without taking any notice of the interruption. Then it seems logical to suppose that one of these five people must have done so. One of them could have done it, I suppose, said de Pleach doubtfully. But I don't see why any of them should. No reason at all. In fact, I'm quite sure none of them did do it. Get this bee out of your bonnet, old boy. But Hercule Poirot only smiled and shook his head. Counsel for the Prosecution Guilty as hell, said Mr. Fogg succinctly. Hercule Poirot looked meditatively at the thin, clear-cut face of the barrister. Quentin Fogg, K.C., was a very different type from Montague de Pleach. De Pleach had a force, magnetism, an overbearing and slightly bullying personality. He got his effects by a rapid and dramatic change of manner. Handsome, urbane, charming one minute, then an almost magical transformation, lips back, snarling smile, out for your blood. Quentin Fogg was thin, pale, singularly lacking in what is called personality. His questions were quiet and unemotional, but steadily persistent. If de Pleach was like a rapier, 
Fogg was like an augur. He bored steadily. He had never reached spectacular fame, but he was known as a first-class man on law. He usually won his cases. Hercule Poirot eyed him meditatively. So that, he said, was how it struck you. Fogg nodded. He said, You should have seen her in the box. Old Humpy Randolph, he was leading, you know, simply made mincemeat of her. Mincemeat! He paused, and then said unexpectedly, On the whole, you know, it was rather too much of a good thing. I am not sure, said Hercule Poirot, that I quite understand you. Fogg drew his delicately marked brows together. His sensitive hand stroked his bare upper lip. He said, How shall I put it? It's a very English point of view. Uh, shooting the sitting bird describes it best. Is that intelligible to you? It is, as you say, a very English point of view, but I think I understand you. In the central criminal court, as on the playing fields of Eton, and in the hunting country, the Englishman likes the victim to have a sporting chance. That's it exactly. Well, in this case, the accused didn't have a chance. Humphrey Rudolph did as he liked with her. It started with her examination by Deplige. She stood up there, you know, as docile as a little girl at a party, answering Deplige's questions with the answers she'd learnt off by heart quite docile, word-perfect, and absolutely unconvincing. She'd been told what to say, and she said it. It wasn't de Pleach's fault. That old Montebank played his part perfectly. But in any scene that needs two actors, one alone can't carry it. She didn't play up to him. It made the worst possible effect on the jury. And then old Humpy got up. I expect you've seen him. He's a great loss." hitching his gown up, swaying back on his feet, and then straight off the mark. As I tell you, he made mincemeat of her, led up to this and that, and she fell into the pitfall every time. He got her to admit the absurdities of her own statements, he got her to contradict herself, she floundered in deeper and deeper, and then he wound up with his usual stuff, very compelling, very convinced. I suggest to you, Mrs. Crail, that this story of yours about stealing conaine in order to commit suicide is a tissue of falsehood. I suggest that you took it in order to administer it to your husband, who was about to leave you for another woman, and that you did deliberately administer it to him. And she looked at him, such a pretty creature, graceful, delicate, and she said, Oh, no, no, I didn't. It was the flattest thing you ever heard. The most unconvincing. I saw old Depleach squirm in his seat. He knew it was all up then. Fogg paused a minute. Then he went on. And yet, I don't know, in some ways it was the cleverest thing she could have done. It appealed to chivalry, to that queer chivalry closely allied to blood sports, which makes most foreigners think her such almighty humbugs. The jury felt, the whole court felt, that she hadn't got a chance. She couldn't even fight for herself. She certainly couldn't put up any kind of a show against a big, clever brute like old Humpy. That weak, unconvincing, oh, no, no, I didn't. It was pathetic, simply pathetic. She was done for. Yes, in a way, it was the best thing she could have done. The jury were only out just over half an hour. They brought her in, guilty, with a recommendation to mercy. Actually, you know, she made a good contrast to the other woman in the case, the girl. The jury were unsympathetic to her from the start. She never turned a hair, very good-looking, hard-boiled, modern. To the women in the court she stood for a type, type of the home-breaker. Homes weren't safe when girls like that were wandering abroad, girls damn full of sex and contemptuous of the rights of wives and mothers. She didn't spare herself, I will say. She was honest, admirably honest, She'd fallen in love with the Myers Crail and he with her, and she'd no scruples at all about taking him away from his wife and child. I admired her in a way. She had guts. De Pleach put in some nasty stuff in cross-examination, and she stood up well to it. But the court was unsympathetic, and the judge didn't like her. Old Avis it was. Been a bit of a rip himself when young, but he's very hot on morality when he's presiding in his robes. His summing up against Caroline Crail was mild as itself. He couldn't deny the facts, but he threw out pretty strong hints as to provocation and all that. Hercule Poirot asked, 
He did not support the suicide theory of the defense? Fogg shook his head. That never really had a leg to stand upon. Mind you, I don't say Depleach didn't do his best with it. He was magnificent. He painted a most moving picture of a great-hearted, pleasure-loving, temperamental man suddenly overtaken by a passion for a lovely young girl, conscience-stricken yet unable to resist. Then his recoil, his disgust with himself, his remorse for the way he was treating his wife and child, and his sudden decision to end it all, the honourable way out. I can tell you it was a most moving performance. Depleach's voice brought tears to your eyes. You saw the poor wretch torn by his passions and his essential decency. The effect was terrific. Only when it was all over and the spell was broken, you couldn't quite square that mythical figure with a Maya's Crail. Everybody knew too much about Crail. He wasn't at all that kind of man. And Depleach hadn't been able to get hold of any evidence to show that he was. I should say Crail came as near as possible to being a man without even a rudimentary conscience. He was a ruthless, selfish, good-tempered, happy egoist. Any ethics he had would have applied to painting. He wouldn't, I'm convinced, have painted a sloppy, bad picture, no matter what the inducement. But for the rest, he was a full-blooded man, and he loved life. Had a zest for it. Suicide? Not he. Not perhaps a very good defence to have chosen. Fogg shrugged his thin shoulders. He said, what else was there? Couldn't sit back and plead that there was no case for the jury, that the prosecution had got to prove their case against the accused. There was a great deal too much proof. She'd handled the poison, admitted pinching it, in fact. There was means, motive, opportunity, everything. One might have attempted to show that these things were artificially arranged, Fogg said bluntly. She admitted most of them. And in any case, it's too far-fetched. You're implying, I presume, that somebody else murdered him and fixed it up to look as though she had done it. You think that quite untenable? Fogg said slowly. I'm afraid I do. You're suggesting the mysterious X. Where do we look for him? Poirot said. Obviously in a close circle. There were five people, were there not, who could have been concerned. Five? Let me see. And there was the old duffer who messed about with his herb-brewing, a dangerous hobby, but an amiable creature. Vague sort of person. Don't see him as X. There was the girl. She might have polished off Caroline, but certainly not a Myers. Then there was the stockbroker, Crail's best friend. That's popular in detective stories, but I don't believe it in real life. There's no one else. Oh, yes, the kid sister. But one doesn't seriously consider her. That's four. Hercule Poirot said, You forget the governess. Oh, yes, that's true. Wretched people, governesses. One never does remember them. I do recall her dimly, though. Middle-aged, plain, competent. I suppose a psychologist would say that she had a guilty passion for Crail and therefore killed him. The repressed spinster? Well, it's no good. I just don't believe it. As far as my dim remembrance goes, she wasn't the neurotic type. It is a long time ago. Fifteen or sixteen years, I suppose. Yes, quite that. You can't expect my memories of the case to be very acute, Hercule Poirot said. But on the contrary, you remember it amazingly well. That astounds me. You can see it, can you not? When you talk, the picture is there before your eyes, Fogg said slowly. Yes, you're right. I do see it, quite plainly, Poirot said. It would interest me, my friend, very much if you would tell me why. Why? Fogg considered the question. His thin intellectual face was alert, interested. Yes, now, why? Poirot asked. What do you see so plainly? The witnesses? The counsel? The judge? The accused standing in the dock? Fogg said quietly. Oh, that's the reason, of course. You've put your finger on it. I shall always see her. Funny thing, romance. She had the quality of it. I don't know if she was really beautiful. She wasn't very young. Tired-looking. Circles under her eyes. But it all centred round her. The interest. The drama. And yet, half the time she wasn't there. She'd gone away somewhere. Quite far away. Just left her body there. Quiescent, attentive, with the little polite smile on her lips. 
She was all half-tones, you know, lights and shades, and yet with it all she was more alive than the other, that girl with the perfect body and the beautiful face and the crude young strength. I admired Elsa Greer because she had guts, because she could fight, because she stood up to her tormentors and never quailed, but I admired Caroline Crail because she didn't fight, because she retreated into her world of half-lights and shadows. She was never defeated, because she never gave battle. He paused. I'm only sure of one thing. She loved the man she killed. Loved him so much that half of her died with him. Mr. Fogg, K.C., paused and polished his glasses. Dear me, he said, oh, I seem to be saying some very strange things. I was quite a young man at the time, you know, just an ambitious youngster. These things make an impression. But all the same, I am sure that Caroline Crail was a very remarkable woman. I shall never forget her. No, I shall never forget her. The Young Solicitor George Mayhew was cautious and noncommittal. He remembered the case, of course, but not at all clearly. His father had been in charge. He himself had been only nineteen at the time. Yes, the case had made a great stir. Because of Crail being such a well-known man, his pictures were very fine, very fine indeed. Two of them were in the Tate, not that that meant anything. Monsieur Poirot would excuse him, but he didn't see quite what Monsieur Poirot's interest was in the matter. Oh, the daughter! Really? Indeed. Canada. He had always heard it was New Zealand. George Mayhew became less rigid. He unbent. A shocking thing in a girl's life. He had the deepest sympathy for her. Really, it would have been better if she had never learned the truth. Still, it was no use saying that now. She wanted to know? Yes, but what was there to know? There were the reports of the trial, of course. He himself didn't really know anything. No, he was afraid there wasn't much doubt as to Mrs. Crail's being guilty. There was a certain amount of excuse for her. These artists— Difficult people to live with. With Crail, he understood, it had always been some woman or other. And she herself had probably been the possessive type of woman, unable to accept facts. Nowadays, she'd simply have divorced him and got over it. He added cautiously, Let me see, uh, Lady Dittisham, I believe, was the girl in the case? Poirot said that he believed that that was so. The newspapers bring it up from time to time, said Mayhew. She's been in the divorce court a good deal. She's a very rich woman, as I expect you know. She was married to that explorer fellow before Dittisham. She's always more or less in the public eye, the kind of woman who likes notoriety, I should imagine. Or possibly a hero-worshipper, suggested Poirot. The idea was upsetting to George Mayhew. He accepted it dubiously. Well, uh, possibly, yes, I suppose that might be so. He seemed to be turning the idea over in his mind. Poirot said— had your firm acted for Mrs. Crail for a long period of years? George Mayhew shook his head. On the contrary, Jonathan and Jonathan were the Crail solicitors. Under the circumstances, however, Mr. Jonathan felt that he could not very well act for Mrs. Crail, and he arranged with us, with my father, to take over her case. You would do well, I think, Monsieur Poirot, to arrange a meeting with old Mr. Jonathan. He has retired from active work. He is over seventy, but he knew the Crail family intimately and he could tell you far more than I can. Indeed, I myself can tell you nothing at all. I was a boy at the time. I didn't think I was even in court. Poirot rose, and George Mayhew, rising too, added, You might like to have a word with Edmonds, our managing clerk. He was with the firm then, and took a great interest in the case. Edmonds was a man of slow speech. His eyes gleamed with legal caution. He took his time in sizing up Poirot before he let himself be betrayed into speech. He said, Ah, oh, yeah, I mind the Crail case. He added severely, It was a disgraceful business. His shrewd eyes rested appraisingly on Hercule Poirot. He said, It's a long time since to be raking things up again. A court verdict is not always an ending. Edmund's square head nodded slowly. I'd not say that you weren't in the right of it there. Hercule Poirot went on. Mrs. Crail left a daughter. Aye, I mind there was a child, 
sent abroad to relatives, was she not? Poirot went on, that daughter believes firmly in her mother's innocence. The huge, bushy eyebrows of Mr. Edmonds rose. Ah, oh, that's the way of it, is it? Poirot asked, is there anything you can tell me to support that belief? Edmonds reflected. Then, slowly, he shook his head. I could not conscientiously say that there was. I admired Mrs. Crail. Whatever else she was, she was a lady, not like the other, a hussy, no more, no less, bold as brass, jumped up trash. That's what she was, and showed it. Mrs. Crail was quality. But nonetheless a murderess. Edmunds frowned. He said with more spontaneity than he had yet shown, That's what I used to ask myself day after day, sitting there in the dock, so calm and gentle. I'll not believe it, I used to say to myself. But if you take my meaning, Monsieur Poirot, there wasn't anything else to believe. That hemlock didn't get into Mr. Crail's beer by accident. It was put there. And if Mrs. Crail didn't put it there, who did? That is the question, said Poirot. Who did? Again those shrewd old eyes searched his face. So that's your idea? said Mr. Edmonds. What do you think yourself? There was a pause before the officer answered. Then he said, There was nothing that pointed that way. Nothing at all. Poirot said, You were in court during the hearing of the case. Every day. You heard the witnesses give evidence? I did. Did anything strike you about them, any abnormality, any insincerity? Edmund said bluntly, Was one of them lying, do you mean? Had one of them a reason to wish Mr. Crail dead? If you'll excuse me, Monsieur Poirot, that's a very melodramatic idea. At least consider it, Poirot urged. He watched the shrewd face, the screwed-up thoughtful eyes. Slowly, regretfully, Edmund shook his head. That Miss Greer, he said. She was bitter enough. And vindictive. I'd say she overstepped the mark in a good deal she said. But it was Mr. Crail alive she wanted. He was no use to her dead. She wanted Mrs. Crail hanged all right. But that was because death had snatched her man away from her. Like a balked tigress she was. But as I say, it was Mr. Crail alive she'd wanted. Mr. Philip Blake, he was against Mrs. Crail, too, prejudiced, got his knife into her whenever he could, but I'd say he was honest, according to his lights. He'd been Mr. Crail's great friend. His brother, Mr. Meredith Blake, a bad witness he was, vague, hesitating, never seemed sure of his answers. I've seen many witnesses like that, look as though they're lying when all the time they're telling the truth, didn't want to say anything more than he could help. Mr. Meredith Blake didn't. Counsel got all the more out of him on that account. One of these quiet gentlemen who get easily flustered. And the governess now, she stood up well to them, didn't waste words, and answered patent to the point. You couldn't have told, listening to her, which side she was on. Got all her wits about her, she had. The brisk kind. He paused. Knew a lot more than she ever let on about the whole thing, I shouldn't wonder. I, too, should not wonder said Hercule Poirot. He looked sharply at the wrinkled, shrewd face of Mr. Alfred Edmonds. It was quite bland and impassive. But Hercule Poirot wondered if he had been vouchsafed a hint. THE OLD SOLICITOR Mr. Caleb Jonathan lived in Essex. After a courteous exchange of letters, Poirot received an invitation almost royal in its character, to dine and sleep. The old gentleman was decidedly a character. After the insipidity of young George Mayhew, Mr. Jonathan was like a glass of his own vintage port. He had his own methods of approach to a subject, and it was not until well on towards midnight, when sipping a glass of fragrant old brandy, that Mr. Jonathan really unbent. In oriental fashion, he had appreciated Hercule Poirot's courteous refusal to rush him in any way. Now, in his own good time, he was willing to elaborate the theme of the Crail family. Our firm, of course, has known many generations of the Crails. I knew Amias Crail and his father, Richard Crail, 
and I can remember Enoch Crail, the grandfather. Country squires, all of them, thought more of horses than human beings. They rode straight, liked women, and had no truck with ideas. They distrusted ideas, but Richard Crail's wife was cram full of ideas, more ideas than sense. She was poetical and musical. She played the harp, you know. She enjoyed poor health and looked very picturesque on her sofa. She was an admirer of Kingsley. That's why she called her son Amias. His father scoffed at the name, but he gave in. Amias Crail profited by his mixed inheritance. He got his artistic trend from his weakly mother, and his driving power and ruthless egoism from his father. All the Crails were egoists. They never by any chance saw any point of view but their own. Tapping with a delicate finger on the arm of his chair, the old man shot a shrewd glance at Poirot. Correct me if I am wrong, Monsieur Poirot, but I think you are interested in uh, character, shall we say? Poirot replied, That to me is the principal interest of all my cases. I can conceive of it, to get under the skin, as it were, of your criminal. How interesting, how absorbing. Our firm, of course, have never had a criminal practice. We should not have been competent to act for Mrs. Crail, even if taste had allowed. Mayhew's, however, were a very adequate firm. They briefed de Pleach. They didn't perhaps show much imagination there. Still, he was very expensive and, of course, exceedingly dramatic. <laughs> what they hadn't the wits to see was that Caroline would never play up in the way he wanted her to. She wasn't a dramatic woman. What was she? asked Poirot. It is that I am chiefly anxious to know. Yes, yes, of course. And how did she come to do what she did? That is the really vital question. I knew her, you know, before she married. Caroline Spaulding she was. A turbulent, unhappy creature, very alive. Her mother was left a widow early in life, and Caroline was devoted to her mother. Then the mother married again. There was another child. Yes, yes, very sad, very painful. These young, ardent, adolescent jealousies. She was jealous? Oh, passionately so. There was a regrettable incident. Poor child. She blamed herself bitterly afterwards. But you know, Monsieur Poirot, these things happen. There is an inability to put on the brakes. It comes, it comes with maturity. Poirot said, What happened? She struck the child, the baby, flung a paperweight at her. The child lost the sight of one eye and was permanently disfigured. Mr. Jonathan sighed. He said, You can imagine the effect a simple question on that point had at the trial. He shook his head. It gave the impression that Caroline Crell was a woman of ungovernable temper. That was not true. No, that was not true. He paused and then resumed. Caroline Spaulding came often to stay at Alderbury. She rode well and was keen. Richard Crail was fond of her. She waited on Mrs. Crail and was deft and gentle. Mrs. Crail also liked her. The girl was not happy at home. She was happy at Alderbury. Diana Crail, Amias's sister, and she were by way of being friends. Philip and Meredith Blake, boys from the adjoining estate, were frequently at Alderbury. Philip was always a nasty, money-grubbing little brute. I must confess I have always had a distaste for him. But I am told that he tells a very good story, and that he has the reputation of being a staunch friend. Meredith was what my contemporaries used to call namby-pamby, liked botany and butterflies and observing birds and beasts. Nature study, they call it nowadays. Ah, dear, all the young people were a disappointment to their parents. None of them ran true to type, hunting, shooting, fishing. Meredith preferred watching birds and animals to shooting or hunting them. Philip definitely preferred town to country and went into the business of money-making. Diana married a fellow who wasn't a gentleman, one of the temporary officers in the war. And Amias, strong, handsome, virile Amias, blossomed into being a painter, of all things in the world. It's my opinion that Richard Crail died of the shock. And in due course, Amias married Caroline Spaulding. 
They'd always fought and sparred, but it was a love match all right. They were both crazy about each other, and they continued to care. But Amias was like all the Crails, a ruthless egoist. He loved Caroline, but he never once considered her in any way. He did as he pleased. It's my opinion that he was as fond of her as he could be of anybody. But she came a long way behind his art. That came first. And I should say at no time did his art give place to a woman. He had affairs with women. They stimulated him. But he left them high and dry when he'd finished with them. He wasn't a sentimental man nor a romantic one. And he wasn't entirely a sensualist either. The only woman he cared a button for was his own wife. And because she knew that, she put up with a lot. He was a very fine painter, you know. She realized that and respected it. He chased off in his amorous pursuits and came back again, usually with a picture to show for it. It might have gone on like that if it hadn't come to Elsa Greer. Elsa Greer. Mr. Jonathan shook his head. Poirot said, What of Elsa Greer? Mr. Jonathan said unexpectedly, Poor child. Poor child. Poirot said, So you feel like that about her? Jonathan said, Maybe it's because I'm an old man, but I find, Monsieur Poirot, that there is something about the defencelessness of youth that moves me to tears. Youth is so vulnerable. It is so ruthless so sure, so generous, and so demanding. Getting up, he crossed to the bookcase. Taking out a volume, he opened it, turned the pages, and then read out, If that thy bent of love be honourable, the purpose marriage, send me word to-morrow, by one that I'll procure to come to thee. Where and what time thou wilt perform the rite, and all my fortunes at thy foot I'll lay and follow thee, my lord, throughout the world. There speaks love, allied to youth, in Juliet's words. No reticence, no holding back, no so-called maiden modesty. It is the courage, the insistence, the ruthless force of youth. Shakespeare knew youth. Juliet singles out Romeo. Desdemona claims Othello. They have no doubts, the young. No fear. No pride, Poirot said thoughtfully. So to you, Elsa Greer spoke in the words of Juliet. Yes, she was a spoiled child of fortune, young, lovely, rich. She found her mate and claimed him, no young Romeo, a married, middle-aged painter. Elsa Greer had no code to restrain her. She had the code of modernity. Take what you want, we shall only live once. He sighed leaned back, and again tapped gently on the arm of his chair. A predatory Juliet, young, ruthless, but horribly vulnerable, staking everything on the one audacious throw, and seemingly she won. And then, at the last moment, death steps in, and the living, ardent, joyous Elsa died also. There was left only a vindictive, cold, hard woman, hating with all her soul the woman whose hand had done this thing. His voice changed. Dear, dear, pray forgive this little lapse into melodrama. A crude young woman with a crude outlook on life. Not, I think, an interesting character. Rose-white youth, passionate, pale, etc. Take that away, and what remains? Only a somewhat mediocre young woman seeking for another life-sized hero to put on an empty pedestal. Poirot said, If Amias Crail had not been a famous painter, Mr. Jonathan agreed quickly. He said, Quite, quite, you have taken the point admirably. The Elsas of this world are hero worshippers. A man must have done something, must be somebody. Caroline Crail now could have recognized quality in a bank clerk or an insurance agent. Caroline loved Amias Crail the man, not Amias Crail the painter. Caroline Crail was not crude. Elsa Greer was. He added, But she was young and beautiful, and to my mind, infinitely pathetic. Hercule Poirot went to bed thoughtful. He was fascinated by the problem of personality. To Edmonds, the clerk, Elsa Greer was a hussy, no more, no less. To old Mr. Jonathan, she was the eternal Juliet. And Caroline Crail? 
Each person had seen her differently. Montague de Pleach had despised her as a defeatist, a quitter. To young Fogg, she had represented romance. Edmonds saw her simply as a lady. Mr. Jonathan had called her a stormy, turbulent creature. How would he, Hercule Poirot, have seen her? On the answer to that question depended, he felt, the success of his quest. So far, not one of the people he had seen had doubted that whatever else she was, Caroline Crail was also a murderess. The Police Superintendent Ex-Superintendent Hale pulled thoughtfully at his pipe. He said, This is a funny fancy of yours, Monsieur Poirot. It is perhaps a little unusual, Poirot agreed cautiously. You see, said Hale, it's all such a long time ago. Hercule Poirot foresaw that he was going to get a little tired of that particular phrase. He said mildly, That adds to the difficulty, of course. Raking up the past, mused the other. If there were an object in it now, uh, there is an object. What is it? One can enjoy the pursuit of truth for its own sake. I do. And you must not forget the young lady. Hale nodded. Yes, well, I see her side of it, but uh, you'll excuse me, Monsieur Poirot. You're an ingenious man. You could cook her up a tail. Poirot replied, You do not know the young lady. Oh, come now, a man of your experience. Poirot drew himself up. I may be, mon cher, an artistic and competent liar. You seem to think so, but it is not my idea of ethical conduct. I have my standards. Sorry, Mr. Poirot, <laughs> I didn't mean to hurt your feelings, but it would be all in a good cause, so to speak. Oh, I wonder, would it really? Hale said slowly. It's tough luck on a happy, innocent girl who's just going to get married to find that her mother was a murderess. If I were you, I'd go to her and say that, after all, suicide was what it was. Say the case was mishandled by de Pleach. Say that there's no doubt in your mind that Crail poisoned himself. But there is every doubt in my mind. I do not believe for one minute that Crail poisoned himself. Do you consider it even reasonably possible yourself? Slowly Hale shook his head. You see? No. It is the truth I must have, not a plausible or not a very plausible lie. Hale turned and looked at Poirot. His square, rather red face grew a little redder, and even appeared to get a little squarer. He said, You talk about the truth. I'd like to make it plain to you that we think we got the truth in the Crail case. Poirot said quickly, That pronouncement from you means a great deal. I know you for what you are, an honest and capable man. Now, tell me this. Was there no doubt at any time in your mind as to the guilt of Mrs. Crail? The superintendent's answer came promptly. No doubt at all, Monsieur Poirot. The circumstances pointed to her straight away, and every single fact that we uncovered supported that view. You can give me an outline of the evidence against her? I can. When I received your letter, I looked up the case. He picked up a small notebook. I've jotted down all the salient facts here. Thank you, my friend. I am all eagerness to hear. Hale cleared his throat. A slight official intonation made itself heard in his voice. He said, At 2.45 on the afternoon of September the 18th, Inspector Conway was rung up by Dr. Andrew Fawcett. Dr. Fawcett stated that Mr. Amias Crail of Alderbury had died suddenly and that in consequence of the circumstances of that death and also of a statement made to him by a Mr. Blake, a guest staying in the house, he considered that it was a case for the police. Inspector Conway, in company with a sergeant and the police surgeon, came over to Alderbury straight away. Dr. Fawcett was there and took him to where the body of Mr. Crail had not been disturbed. Mr. Crail had been painting in a small enclosed garden, known as the Battery Garden, from the fact that it overlooked the sea, and had some miniature cannon placed in embattlements. It was situated at about four minutes' walk from the house. Mr. Crail had not come up to the house for lunch, as he wanted to get certain effects of light on the stone, and the sun would have been wrong for this later. He had, therefore, remained alone in the Battery Garden painting. 
This was stated not to be an unusual occurrence. Mr. Crayle took very little notice of meal times. Sometimes a sandwich would be sent down to him, but more often he preferred to remain undisturbed. The last people to see him alive were Miss Elsa Greer, staying in the house, and Mr. Meredith Blake, a near neighbour. These two went up together to the house and went with the rest of the household into lunch. After lunch, coffee was served on the terrace. Mrs. Crail finished drinking her coffee and then observed that she would go down and see how Amias was getting on. Miss Cecilia Williams, a governess, got up and accompanied her. She was looking for a pullover belonging to her pupil, Miss Angela Warren, a sister of Mrs. Crail, which the latter had mislaid, and she thought it possible it might have been left down on the beach. These two started off together. The path led downwards through some woods, until it emerged at the door leading into the battery garden. You could either go into the battery garden, or you could continue on the same path which led down to the seashore. Miss Williams continued on down, and Mrs. Crail went into the battery garden. Almost at once, however, Mrs. Crail screamed, and Miss Williams hurried back. Mr. Crail was reclining on a seat, and he was dead. End of Disc 1